Good evening. It's another episode with libertarianprogressive.com, blogtalkradio.com forward slash blast of fresh air. And uh, we interview independents and third party candidates who are on the ballot uh, running for the U.S. Congress and some various positions like attorney general, senate, governor, etc., and also some state races. But we interview people who are on the ballot who are not a Republican and Democrat mostly and um and who are the only alternate third party option this year 2016 and today we have a great interview with mike trout who's an independent running for the u.s house district number 21 in florida and let's bring him in and uh and so if you visit libertarianprogressive.com right now you'll see nine interviews by Tomorrow, you're going to see about uh, 15 interviews. By the end of this week, you'll probably see about 25 interviews. And by the end of October, um, somewhere near 50 interviews. And imagine if, um, if we sent uh, people that um, you know, aren't the status quo, that are independent, third-party candidates who uh, you know, represent the people who are on the ballots and, uh, you know, not the same old Republicans and Democrats and just 50 of them just to kind of break the ice and uh, have some different kind of representation, more competition. So, Michael, thank you for joining us or, or Mike. And actually, Mike's website is campaign for good government dot com if you want to learn more. And I was looking at your website and it has uh a lot of issues. If you scroll down to the very bottom, there is probably the most issues I think I've ever seen. It's like this guy was meant to run for Congress and to be elected to Congress. You would be introducing legislation left and right, I can tell. And so we'll go over a lot of those issues. I don't think we'll even have time to go over every single one. Um, I'd like to go over some that I think that has consensus across the board here. I mean, there's just so many to pick from. Um, it's like Jeopardy. I can just pick uh, for $200. Uh, here's one. But um, let's just start with a fun one. Um, no more dupes. And actually, please introduce yourself. Explain to us why you're running as an independent and not a Republican and a Democrat this year, Mike. And um, and, and just uh, introduce yourself to our audience, please, sir. Hi, Tom. It's uh, great to be here. I well, here, I'm out here in the ether. <laughs> I do appreciate the invitation to be on and, and to talk about some of these issues. Well, proposals, really, um, because I don't, I, I think, really, I think every candidate should be obligated to disclose what they would put on the table. If you have any premeditated agenda, I think it should be the law that you should disclose it on your campaign websites. Well, now we're in the 2000s. Yeah, you just say, yes, you have to just, you have to have a website and you have to disclose what your agenda is. And so I don't want anybody, you know, to come along and say, oh, you know, you didn't say you were going to do this. <laughs> no, this is, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> this is what, what I'm going to put on the table. You know, I'm not, none of us are running for king. So all we can really do is, Put something on the table and debate it. That's the job of a congressperson to debate. And so, um, and that it, it, actually, it, Mike, uh, if I, you said you wanted to talk about dupes to start with. Yeah, I was going to talk about dupes, and actually, what you're saying by putting everything on the table is just one step away for having a referendum for America. Um, you know, but yes, please. Um, that sounds like a more fun one here. It sounds legitimate as well. So yes, please. Uh, let's start with dupes. D U P E S. Well, dupes is an acronym that, that I came up with to, it stands for disruptive, unnecessary political elections. And you have a dupe when someone who's taken an oath to take an office for a designated term um decides to jump ship before their term is up uh to further their own career um and you know there's a cost to that there's a cost associated with that that the taxpayers and the voters have to bear you know a special election uh might not cost much for a special election for dog catcher but when you have a say a senator well i mean not not to pick on anybody but marco rubio is running for senate and it's a six-year term and he says you know he's not going to commit to whether he's going to serve it out or not i i think yeah. that should disqualify him you know that's the oath you take you take an oath 
to to for this office and the and the and the people vote for you and you know have confidence that you're that you're going to serve out your term. So that to me, that's what a dupe is. It's a disruptive, unnecessary political election. There's cost to it, uh, both political and economic, and I just don't think we should have them. So. They, there's, you know, I guess you can't always say there's sometimes when maybe it might be appropriate, but if at the very least, if somebody's going, if somebody's going to cause a dupe, then they should bear the cost of it, either either themselves or their party or somebody should pay for it, and not the taxpayers that already paid for an election to get you in there in the first place. Yeah, if you're running for the right reasons, I mean, you'd probably want to finish out your term. And a lot of these people are just using it as a stepping stone. And I think people on both aisles, per se, would kind of, you know, like that. Well, let's go into um, a couple here. Uh, There's a lot of good ones here. And um, tie my salary. Tom, can I interrupt you? Because um, we might as well. I I don't, I think everything that, that I address is important. But uh, I, there's one issue that is top of the agenda. It has to be because of its life and death, blood and guts consequences, and that's police reform. And, um, okay. you know, I don't hate police. My father was a police officer. He was also a warden of a federal penitentiary named in 1969 when uh, the entire federal prison population was about 200,000. And now we now we incarcerate more people in this country than any other country on earth. Yeah, we're number one. We're number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and we probably spend more. And and you know what? When I hear about um, the high incarceration rate, I, I think something that doesn't quite hit home is um, you know how politicians show people as an example, like you know Al Gore or something will point to someone in the crowd. There's Betty, and I visited her bakery. Well. You know, people really should see the victims of, you you know, um, and people going to jail for the drug war and and nonviolent crimes. And, uh, you know, that's just been through the system. People in jail for in prison for longer than people have committed rape and murder for just, you know, selling drugs or doing drugs and doing no harm to anyone else for themselves. I mean, it's quite a racket when you go into the private prison industry and everything else. I mean, we have a ton ton more people in prison than any other country and i mean that's just a fact it sure is and it's and it's got to be addressed and i i think you know one thing i liked about your website talking about progressive libertarian and i gotta admit i don't know everything about progressive libertarianism um but there was two things that that struck me from your website and one is the idea of consensus and the first group that I ever was uh, associated with that was um, really big on consensus was the Occupy movement back in uh, 2014. And, you know, consensus, I didn't really go into the details, but as I understand it, you know, it goes way beyond a simple majority. You know, people have to talk things out until we get to some kind of a, a, you know, a broad understanding across aisles and everything. And I think we've come to that with, police and prison reform. I think we're at a consensus moment where we, we could actually do do some things differently and um, people would be receptive to it, you know, the, both the voters and then the people that represent the voters. Well, And the other just thing... A, yeah, go, okay, please, go, go ahead. Well, I was just... Well, my uh, God. The, I was trying to remember the, the two things that really struck me about your website. Was that, you know, the 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 focus on consensus. And then the other thing is, is it, you know, is it about whether we win or how we play the game? And so we've seen a lot of examples of, you know, I learned a long time ago in this psychology school uh, called the transactional analysis that the hardest thing to do in, in this world is to get people to play by their own rules. You know, we have rules and, and Americans are really fair people, you know, you know, our, uh, so looking at sports, for example, you know, Americans really believe in an even playing field. They don't like to see a bad call by an hump, you know, 
and uh, they want to see they want to see their na- neighbors treated fairly. They want the rules to work for everybody, and we haven't seen that on we haven't seen that in this duopoly politics that dominates our political landscape in, in a long time. Um, we saw recently uh, on the left and around the Republicans and the Democrats, where you know the party leadership wanted to dictate who you know who should win the elections rather than the voters tell them who they want to win the elections and um so you know they're they're breaking their own rules yeah i mean most people um don't object to you, you know not guaranteeing who wins or not the main thing is having a level playing field knowing that you're part of a fair game you know and yeah. um, why play a game if i know that you know the referee is the uh you know, father-in-law of my opponent or something like that, you know, I want to be in a fair game, then, you know, may the best person win, but at least I was in the fair game. It's corruption, you know. (laughs) Well, and about the fair game, you have a couple issues here that refer to that. One's called People's Frank, another is called Tie My Salary to Your Salary. How about those two? Well, Tying my salary to your salary is pretty simple. You're you're elected to represent the people, uh, and it makes sense that your pay should be based on merit. Now, and I live in a pretty wealthy county, um, but I think the average or the median income in Palm Beach County is about fifty-four thousand dollars a year. Um, in Kentucky, there's you know there's Congressional districts where that might be thirty-four thousand dollars a year. Uh, I think that a congressperson's pay should be tied to what their constituents are making, so that if they do a job that lifts the lifts everyone's boat, they get a raise. And if if uh, if they don't, well, you know, by the same token, your pay goes down. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's in the right um that's in the right track there. What about people's frank? Well, I don't know if you're you know, probably most people are familiar with the the franking privilege that um Congress has. You know, they get the uh postage free mail to uh mail to constituents and oddly enough around election time they go that that kind of mail goes way up, you know, they they slip in a lot of electioneering stuff in there. Um, and anyways, we, you know, there's a media that covers, uh, covers what's going on in Congress. Congress persons themselves should report what they're doing, you know, what bills they're putting forward, what bills they're, what bills they're supporting, what bills they're voting against, whatever. And it should be widely available on the internet. There's really no reason why, You have to wait for the corporate media to pick up on it. (laughs) You know, it should just be duly noted and reported uh, on a, on a regular basis. But I, you know, it's crazy, but in the richest country in the world, everybody's not even on the internet, you know? Yeah. So uh, the, the Frank would just, the, the people's Frank would just reverse that privilege so that Congress no longer gets it. And instead, we pay for anybody that wants to write to their representative. There's no barriers. Uh, We've we've got the greatest postal service in the whole world. Uh, They very very rarely ever lose anything. (laughs) Um, And if you want to write your your congressman, your mayor, your anybody, you know, there shouldn't be a barrier to that. So if you can't pop off an email then you should be able to pop a letter in the mail or a postcard in the mail and it shouldn't shouldn't cost you a thing. We're paying we're paying for it. We're paying for our government. So that's just uh since since that's gonna facilitate uh people's communication to their representatives, I, I think it's a, a worthwhile thing to pay for. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I second your um we, we have a great post office and just one quick thing is that, you know, a lot of Republicans seem not to like the post office. They're chomping at the bit to privatize it and stuff. And I have nothing against UPS or FedEx or someone wants to compete with the post office. But um, right. you would think that the post office would be the ideal 
uh, type of government program because for two reasons. It's completely voluntary, and it absolutely pays for itself. And, and if you're a, con- a real conservative, what more would you want from a government program that is completely voluntary and pays for itself? It should be the poster child of a Republican-type uh, program, uh, not the opposite. Um, so, so now you have a... So with the love of the Constitution, it's the only constitutionally mandated... Uh, a program, I think, in the Constitution. I mean, the, the post office, the Postal Service, was designated in the Constitution, if I'm not mistaken. Benjamin Franklin was the first uh, postmaster general. And um, now you had a real cool uh, act here. It's called the Freeway Commerce Act. Uh, can you tell me more about the Freeway Commerce Act, Mike? Well, Freeway Commerce, it's not really limited number one, to freeways, but I call it the Freeway Commerce Act because uh, we're looking for ways to, um, you know, I'd say I'm kind of a leftist, yeah, but I'm not anti-enterprise. And um, so I'm looking around and I'm saying, where can we, where can the federal government, um, I don't think we can create markets. Where can we identify markets? And when I travel on the interstate highways, I see these these public lands, you know, which are like the rest areas and, you know, places like this, and there's several hundred people an hour stopping at sure. these places. They, it's a market, you know, but they but they look kind of like uh there you know, there's 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 not there's no economic activity going on there. A lot of them are close to rural areas, you know, that are are begging for people to stop in their areas, and usually they just drive right on by, right? So here's a place that you could foster enterprise, new enterprise, without 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 taking over, without nationalizing anybody's private industry, right? We're not stealing it from anybody. We're not taking it by eminent domain. It belongs to the public, and um, yeah. It just looks like an ideal place for uh, anything from ambulatory vendors, from hot dog vendors, to musicians, to you know, a marketplace, a vibrant marketplace. And um, Absolutely. I mean, if I was a small vendor, I'd at least want the opportunity to give it a shot there. I mean, if you get hundreds of people there at least every day at a rest stop, I mean, you know, and it oh, seems like. I mean, thousands, There's crony thousands, capitalism because, going you know, on. Yeah, sure. It's a market. I'm not creating the market. I, I just identified it. Um, you know, in a lot of, uh, well, like I live in Palm Beach County, and I suppose all, most, if not all, counties in the country, you know, they have like roadside permit programs, you know, where, you know, you see, you know, one vendor here and, and spread around. But, but here's a place with everything built in. I mean, you got facilities, you know. Yeah, you've got um, you've got light. It's, it's open 24 hours a day. It just seems it just seems ready to go, you know. Yeah, I mean, you might see everything from the hot dog lady to you, you know whatever else. I mean, and who wouldn't want to see that? Um, and now, um, if people selling shirts, uh, different things, um, you know, it's in Florida. People might have crafts that have like seashells and, and so crafts, on. And, uh, artists, all yeah. that. You know, and um, uh, there's just really, uh, it's turnkey. It's ready to go. It's ready to go. Now, now. You had a... But right now, the only thing going on economically, <laughs> there's uh, somebody that has a uh, has a concession on the vending machines and they charge about two or three bucks for a bottle of water. And uh, a few weeks ago I was at one and the machine ate like $4 before on the third try we got a bottle of water. So a $6 bottle of water, you know, no competition. No, whatever. Yeah. So so it sounds like, you you are for, for competition and uh, competition in this congressional race as well. Yes, yes. And now, comp- Mike, I now do want to ask a competition. Pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry. There's just a, there's a couple second delay, so I'm so sorry to interrupt. But yeah, please keep continuing on competition. Oh well, you say competition in the congressional race, so that gets around to the thing about uh, 
free, fair, and open elections. You know, we um, we tie foreign aid and we tie foreign policy to um, free elections in countries like I don't know Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti. Uh, you know, where where we perceive governments to be uh, corrupt, we we put rules in about. You know, we impose upon them rules for what constitutes a free, fair, and open election, you know. And um, we need some electoral reform here. It's not just Citizens United. It's not just money. You know, it's uh, it's a lot of little structural reforms that have to be made so that we could really have competitive races where, you know, that it's not dominated by Republicans or Democrats. Now, that doesn't mean that I want to see the Republican Party die or the Democratic Party die. I think that when you make a, a level playing field and fair rules, that that's going to strengthen institutions, you know, that's going to, that's going to strengthen the Republican Party. It's going to strengthen the Democratic Party. It, it's also, but it's also, yes, going to open, open the debate up to independent ideas. You know, yeah, absolutely. It's new people, you know, people that aren't on the cocktail circuit, people that, uh, you know. Well, let me ask, ask you this. What does Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom have in common? Uh, universal health care, for one thing. Oh, they, well, they, well all, if you're talking about... They all have multiple parties, if, if that's where you're going. That's right. They're all first world countries that have at least four main parties. Yeah. Yes. That's, yes. And that's healthy. You know, that's a healthy debate. And, um, you know, they've gotten, they have healthy debates in those countries. Loud sometimes, boisterous, but they have healthy debate. And we, you know, we don't get that. It's so it's so circumscribed by, well, like right now, the, the presidential debates, for instance, is controlled by just the two parties. And, you know, rather than, rather than set it up up upon what our values should be, which is pretty fair and open debate, they try to take an, take advantage by keeping people out. And that's just crazy in a democracy. Well, Mike, Mike, I want to ask you about the Auxiliary Act. Um, please explain. Um, and, and again, this is um, we're talking to Mike Trout. He's an independent on the ballot candidate running in for Florida's um, district number 21. He's the only alternate candidate besides the Republican and the Democrats uh, this year in 2016. So, you know, people might be interested in checking out his campaign. And to do that, you would visit Campaign for Good Government dot com where you're going to find a lot of interesting issues uh, uh, just scroll down on the main home page and you'll find the auxiliary act for one among many of them and could you explain the auxiliary act a little bit yeah i would tom when i look at agencies that, that are plagued with problems when i look at the va or uh I, you know, almost any with the driver license bureau, almost any public facing agency or institution, I see an organization that would benefit. Well, I think back to if, if you've ever been in the life of a church, you'll know that there's an, usually an informal group called the auxiliary, and they're the people that voluntarily get involved to support the mission of the organization, right? Um, they're, they're not the people that do long-term planning. They're the people that when an emergency comes up, they're, they're the soldiers on the deck right away. And, um, you know, somebody has a fire, uh, they lost everything, you know, these are the people that have a, a meal, a hot meal ready for them tomorrow at breakfast, uh, clothes, you know, whatever. They move fast and they move strong. And they and they're voluntary. They have they have a, a deep committed interest to the success of their community and especially like in you know institutions. When I so the auxiliary act would simply mandate that any public facing 
agency, such as like the VA and all its hospitals, would have to recognize any and uh, any auxiliary that wanted to self form and become you know part of the life of that uh, of that uh, that agency. And you know they, we are, we have these people already. You know there's there's the volunteers and the uh, the people that that keep a close eye on what's going on, and the, and they're the people that know what's going on. In the case of VA, when people aren't getting, um, when when guys that wrote us a blank check aren't, you know, can't get an appointment for months and months, it's it's the community community right there that sees it first. So if you if you have uh, if if you have an auxiliary group that's recognized. That must be recognized by the, you know, by the say parent agency or whatever you want to call it. You know, they have to be, they have to be allowed to perform meaningful volunteer work within the agency would be part of it. They have to be invited to any any public meetings, uh, management meeting, and even planning meetings. They should be made a, a you know a part of that. There's in the VA hospitals we sort of have a little bit of that in that a lot of VA hospitals allow, like say the AMVETS or VFW might have an office in the hospital. And they do, you know, certain work for sort of their constituencies and all. But this would would sort of, the Auxiliary Act would more formalize that relationship and it would um, it would more draw attention so the fact that that door would be open to people, the the activist community, you know, that aren't in it for the money, there, you know, they want to see that everybody's being taken care of, that the operation is moving smoothly, and um, I think it could be a great force for good uh, within within all of these well, all of these agencies. Yeah. Every, from that could be housing news. from healthcare, uh, housing, uh, all these different agencies. Yeah, it could also help some people that might be stuck in in in, in a red tape situation as well, uh, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that could be yeah. very very helpful. And now with the economy, you know, we're like uh, twenty almost twenty trillion dollars in debt. Two thousand eight, we had to do some bailouts. And so, you have written on here um, Wall Street and bank reform. And so, and also take America out of foreclosure. If you could kind of combine those um, or talk about both of those separately, at least. Uh, and, and tell us your thoughts about Wall Street and bank reform and take America out of foreclosure. Well, I, I, I think there's, you know, it's another thing that there's, we're probably getting to a, a consensus on is that, you know, the Wall Street banks have been taking us to the cleaners for a long time now. Um, the foreclosure crisis is, you know, part and parcel of that. And th- yeah, the, the foreclosure. There's there's a few things that go with the foreclosure crisis. I mean, homelessness. Um, you know, we're signatories to the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, we're supposed to make sure that everybody in this country has a decent roof over their head, and that maybe not a luxurious roof over their head, but it, it's it's part of our obligation. We ratified that. And we have to figure out how to meet those obligations. So one thing is you don't foreclose on somebody that's come come upon a medical emergency or whatever, and uh, you know they paid 18 years on their they paid 18 years on a 20 year mortgage. All of a sudden they got sick, they got cancer, they had to stop working, they got behind on their on their payments, and um, you know the bank comes along and, and steals the house. So I would say, A, you just cannot foreclose on a primary residence, okay? Now, if a lender, if a bank didn't want to, you know, had a a borrower who got in such a fix and they didn't want to service that loan anymore, well, then we should have an agency like FHA or somebody like that that will just take it over for them. If they no longer think that you know it's going to be profitable for them to um, to wait on that person, if that person's going to get better enough, you know, 
to take care of those obligations again. Um, so just, I mean, it's pretty simple. No, no foreclosures on a primary on a primary residence. It doesn't mean second homes, investment property, or anything like that. You know, those just follow the regular rules of capitalism. If you know, if you can't sustain them, you'd have to let them go. But but we guarantee the the sanctity of the home. And one thing to tie into that, Mike, is uh, Medicare for all as um, the Affordable Care Act reform. Uh-huh. That's the, that's the that's the only way you know we're we're coming upon such emergencies with with these emerging threats of Zika, malaria, dengue, hemorrhagic dengue, um, even even yellow fever breakouts in Brazil now, um, really dangerous Ebola, Marburg viruses. Um, we at our hepatitis, now there's one that's running all over the country. We have people walking up and down the streets with an infectious disease. And I lost a really dear friend a couple of years back. Um, she died of, of hepatitis, and it was just one of the most horrible deaths that anyone should ever have to go through. And it's one of the few fatal diseases that we have a cure for. We don't have a treatment for it that keeps, you know, that barely keeps people alive. We have a cure for it. And um, you have a company, Gilead Sciences, that went from uh, $19 billion in profits a couple of years ago to I think it was nearly $60 billion in profits last year in 2015. And they're holding back this medicine that cures a, a fatal disease in the name of, of, of profit. Just the, the greed is just, it doesn't serve us well as a society. <laughs> and I don't know what we have to do, whether we have to buy that patent from them. Uh, you know, Bernie, Bernie Sanders had an idea that we said that the federal government should go around and start buying up these, these patents for these important drugs and then let the, let the government license multiple uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers to to get them out there, so that you introduce um, you introduce competition in, into the into the manufacturing process and the sales process, and that would be one way to to bring costs way down on sure. you know on treating some of these things. But again, this isn't. Hepatitis, it's not treating. It's a cure for this horrible disease. And if we don't cure somebody that's walking down the street with it, all we got to do is touch them and catch it ourselves. So, you know, the the virus, it doesn't discriminate between insured people and uninsured people. <laughs> if it finds a way to cross over into a, into a new victim, a new host, it's going to do it. So, you know, we've got to eradicate this. And um, so anyways, of course, the whole thing, Obamacare is a great improvement on what we had, but it's not anywhere near what we need in this country. You know, we've, we, we spend uh, on military defense. We, we don't charge a premium to the people every time we need to drop a bomb, okay? If we're going to have a real war on disease, we have to have, we have, to have single payer funded with general tax revenues <clears throat> to pay for just universal health care access for, from the cradle to from the cradle to the grave from children which thankfully in most states there is some program that you know that helps so like for child health care okay but um, you know everybody should be entitled to health care and again it's at our peril that we exclude anybody. It's totally at the peril of everybody out here when we exclude somebody from health care. Yep, and it's very um, expensive at that. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, we have about five more minutes, so I just want to t- touch on two more issues and then just ask you to also expand on any issues that I, I know there's probably a ton of them, but that you would like to focus on on this um, interview today. 
Uh, you did put on here recorded for quality purposes and peace starts in two hearts. And again, people can read all of your issues at campaign for good government.com. But uh, yeah, if you could um, just expand a little bit on recorded for quality purposes and peace starts in two hearts, Mike. Okay. Well, uh, the, I, I, I'm, I'm Try you know this call is recorded. You know, we've all heard it. This call is recorded for quality purposes. You know what? If somebody, if I consent to participating in a call that's being recorded, <laughs> um, then I should have a right to have access to that to, to that record as much as the other side has access to that record. Um, so that's sales calls. Uh, you know where representations are made. Um, by salespeople to get you to buy some product or whatever. Well, if they're recording that, you know, it's it seems only fair that I should have a copy of that. And so that's all that's about. It just mandates that yeah. now. Or it, even the it, NSA it, nowadays it, might have a copy of it. Yeah. Pardon me? Um, yeah, the NSA, no, I just yeah. Joking. yeah. I was just joking, yeah. but it's probably true, yeah. And what about yeah, peace starts in two hearts? Well, that's you know, we're facing this whole terrorist threat. Uh, real things are happening every day, you know, last week in Manhattan and New Jersey. and It's a terrible, awful thing. A lot of this is arising, at, at least the players claim that it's uh, that the flashpoint is in Israel. The flashpoint is uh, the the Israeli Palestinian situation, right? The occupation mm -hmm. of Palestine. Um, Israel is uh, keeping humanitarian aid, medicines. But people in Palestine can't get medicines, uh, food, all all kinds of things. Their um, their movement is is, is circumscribed um, and there's just a lot of terrible things going on over there but it's not going to change you know, peace starts in two hearts we you know we don't make we don't make peace with our friends um, now we have a history where we've come through a world war with with Germany and a you know a hatred like you know can you imagine Trying, trying to um, measure that hatred back in 1945. Okay, and today we're we're fast friends, mm -hmm. right? So mortal point. enemies can be can become friends. We're great friends with Japan. We're mortal enemies. Um, by the same token, I think we can make peace with the enemies that we have today. But it's but it does take the willingness of two hearts from you know one on each side to make that peace and you know until we can set up the conditions where that will be facilitated, then I'm afraid it's it's more of the same. I don't know if you heard several weeks ago that the son of Bin Laden just took over the operation. Um, I don't know if it's in, now I'm going to, my ignorance is going to show here because I don't know if it was in Iraq or in Syria where he's at. But No, actually that's I, more than I knew. I did not hear about that. Yeah, I'll yeah, have so to look that up. Of Bin Laden, and he, you know, you know, they've got like, you know, a press department, you know, and he put out his statement that, you know, his impetus, his motivation is Palestine. So they're telling us they're telling us what what they want solved. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, it I does think that's uh, absolutely where we've got to start. I think that's where we have to start. <laughs> well you're Our gonna be advocating for system. peace. I'm advocating for peace in the in the broader Middle East e region but I see the flashpoint as being the Israeli-Palestinian situation. And, I, you know, the, the solution that, you know, the whole world is behind is a two-state solution, right? 
uh, granting Palestinian state statehood and granting them the right to to full autonomy, full statehood autonomy, like any other country on earth. And um, I, that's where we've got to get to. Yeah, and we're just going to need to send more states people who are willing to open up that dialogue, uh, such as yourself. And um, now let me ask you uh, in, in closing here two f- final questions. Um, it's going to be, uh, can you please tell me some of your favorite people, if you don't mind, uh, past or present, elected or not? And also just any upcoming events that, uh, like maybe some debates spinning soon. Yeah, well, I'm ex- I, am, I was really pleased. Uh, we had a, an interview the other day at the South Florida Sun Sentinel, for, I guess they call it the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, and um, with myself and my opponent, who is an incumbent. She's not the incumbent for this new district because it is a new district. Um, but I'd been bird dogging her for the last two months and not getting any response about having a debate. But she did in front of the editors of the newspaper. Uh, concede, accept, uh, say that we would have debates. So I'm, I'm glad about that. So that's something upcoming. Uh, nothing set in stone about who, where, or when, you know, it's going to be, but I've, I've got a word that we're going to do that. So, um, and it was really interesting, um, you know, because we're both, we're, I'm a lifetime Democrat. I'm running as an independent because I knew the rules weren't, you know, were set up against me and the thing was rigged. But, um, you know, I said, Lois, I have a lot of respect for all the years of service that you've done and all, and there's a whole lot of things that we probably agree on. But there's the one major thing that we don't agree on. And, you know, she's she's Jewish, and um, I think it was probably hard for her to say, but she did say she supports the two-state solution. So uh, maybe... I think that's going to be a surprise for a lot of the voters. Um, yeah, well, if you don't support you that, you have to ask, what would you support? I mean, what else is there really yeah. left? Well, is it's just going to be endless, you know. And it just can't be, you know. Peace can happen. Um, my good friend, uh, Basil Dalek, Basil Dalek for Senate.com, um, is running on a completely on a peace platform. He won't talk to you about anything else but but peace. He's running for the Florida Senate. Um, and uh, what was the other thing that you asked about? Well, yeah, and another person you might oh, want to. Favorite people. Uh, some of your favorite people, we, yes. Or did I use up my time? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead with this. Yeah. Well, okay, most recently, um, you know, I was a, uh, a supporter of Bernie Sanders. I call myself a Bernie Crat now. You can find out information about other Bernie Kratz at BernieKratz.net. has listings for all the known Bernie Kratz across the country from everywhere, everything from the U.S. Senate down to state house races and uh, mayor, uh, town, city councils, county commissions, et cetera. Um, so before that, the last campaign that I got involved with was Jerry Brown in California back in the 92 ground for president campaign and i look back on you know memorabilia from that campaign and all and wow there's a lot of there's a lot uh, there's a lot of things that we were talking about then that we still haven't fixed i'm sad to say but um but california's way ahead, ahead of us actually california has fixed a lot of things <laughs> And especially recently, when they've had um, when they've had a, a governor and a, a legislature that's working together, because well, because they're all California is pretty much a blue state, so you've got a blue governor and a, and a blue legislature, and, and competitive races out there. They have they have a lot more uh, good uh, fair election laws than the rest of the country. Um, well, I don't um, know. so Bernie Sanders and Jerry Brown. <laughs> Ah, that's really cool. And, and yeah, we actually interviewed one other person who kind of identified as a Bernie Krat Wells. Um, I think he's in a d- another district in Florida, running as an independent in District Three. So I'm, I'm sure there's a few Bernie C- Bernie Krats. Maybe all can get together and y- y- you know. But um, well, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you for taking the time to inform our audience and let them know about uh, 
you know, the options that are available besides just the status quo, you know, and what I mean by that is Republican and Democrat choices, um, you know, everyone's for competition and, and you're actually introducing some competition into your district. So we do thank you very much and uh, good luck in your campaign. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Tom, thanks again. It was my pleasure. I uh, hope to talk to you again sometime. Absolutely. That'd be nice. Uh, have a good one. Thanks a lot. Good night.